Good morning, church. Uh, this is a little awkward, but I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad I could be with you. God bless you on our second Sunday of Advent. Uh, we started last week with our exploration of a Dickens Christmas Carol, and I hope we established the, the point that I wanted to make, and I want us to get together. The, the idea is not we're replacing Christ in Christmas. The birth of Jesus Christ in Nazareth is still the center of what we do and why we do it. And by no means do I want to lose that in the details or the celebration this year. But I introduced the idea, which I believe was introduced by Dickens in this movie. And it's not a far-fetched idea. And that is that the idea or the, the season of Christmas uh, in, in the calendar, church calendar, it starts on Christmas day and goes forward. So we're right now we're actually in the church calendar season of Advent, preparing, getting ready for Christmas, for the coming of Jesus. But for the world, and, and we live in this world, and we are called to be witnesses and advocates and uh, believers and evangelists at such a time as this, and, and the world needs us to do that. So I'm suggesting uh, that we treat Christmas season, not holiday season or whatever the world calls it, but this Christmas season as a thing of its own. And it derives its value and its importance and its joy and its celebratory actions and, and all of the good that we can muster in it from Christ being born at Christmas, not taking away from it, but from that. And Charles Dickens said that in his story, that it, it, if there's anything good about the Christmas season at all, it has to come from its source, which is Jesus Christ being born in a manger. So God coming to earth, you know, in incarnation of the holy God himself. So keeping in that theme, we're going to take a look at a little bit further into the movie. I can't show you too much. I hope to show you a few minutes of it this morning if you saw it already. It, it, it would take all morning to do that. But we looked, we began last week, we looked at uh, who Ebenezer Scrooge was, a little bit about who he was, a stingy, cringy, grasping, selfish, self-centered, mean-spirited, hard-hearted, cold-blooded sinner. And what we look at in this story is the ultimate story of redemption, uh, that if anyone can be saved, if Scrooge can be saved, anyone can be saved. If Scrooge can be saved, can be redeemed, then I can be redeemed, then you can be redeemed. Uh, it's, it's a story repeated for thousands of years. It was a, a story of, uh, of Paul, you know, in Saul becoming Paul, and so many others. It's a story of, of Jacob and Esau when, when Jacob finally comes across with his entourage and he meets his brother and he sends his uh, servant out ahead, not knowing if it's going to be a battle, if he's going to wage war, if he's going to want to kill him, or, but, or reconcile, and they're reconciled after all of the wrong that Jacob has done to him. It's the story of Peter on the seashore eating fish after having betrayed his master. It's a story of you and I to some degree. So I invited you to look at Ebenezer Scrooge and his characteristics and uh, his tendencies and his, his sin, his, his selfishness, and see how much of he is in you or how much of you are in him. So that's what we looked at last week, and I want to wrap up what uh, Dickens called Stave One with some a couple of quotes from the book, and then we're going to look at Psalm 51 together and try to tie this together today as we look forward into the second part, which is the ghost of Christmas past. So a couple of verses come right out of the book from the, um, the first stave at the end of that first part chapter he says to them are there no poor houses are there no work houses you know there's 
And they said that there, some of them are so bad. Yeah, there's plenty of them and they're full, but some of them are so bad that people would rather die to, than go to them. And Scrooge says, well, they had if they would rather die, then they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. You remember that famous quote? It's quoted back to him. And the gentleman says, but you might know this. In other words, this shouldn't be a foreign idea to you. You ought to know that there are people that bad off and that its conditions are so poor. And he says, but I do not know it, for it is not my business, Scrooge says. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's mine occupies me constantly. And then he says, good afternoon, gentlemen. So he introduces this idea is what is a man's business? That's, that's what we preach about all the time. That's what the scripture is all about. That's what sermons are all about. That's what Christ is all about. Why are we here? What is your business? What We just had a sermon just not too long ago about why. Why do we do this? Why are we still here? Why are we saved and left on this planet until he calls us home? Why? What is our business? Scrooge, like so many of us, it says, it's not my business. Mind your own business. Take care of your own business. Don't worry about anybody else's business. You take care of yourself. Take care of your own business. Keep your nose out of it. Keep your nose out of anybody else's business. You just do your own thing. It's not that far off, is it, from some of the things that we've said. Mind. And he says again and again, which betrays what we've already known about Scrooge. Mine, my business, taking care of my business, occupies me completely. That's all I do is take care of my own business. In other words, I'm the only thing that's important in this world. What I do in my business, taking care of myself, is ultimately the only important thing I have to do with my life. And that sneaks in the whole setup of where we go from here. And I'm just, since I'm not here and you can't throw anything at me, let's take a second and think about how much of your time and energy, how much of your emotions and, and finances and, and uh, spirit is just caught up in your stuff because it's your business and it's your life and I need to take care of myself. Let everybody else take care of themselves. It's hard enough to take care of myself. What do I need to do? Be worried about someone else. That's Scrooge. All right. So we jump ahead a little bit more and we get to the visit of Marley's ghost. Christmas Eve, we went through the whole thing in the shop and, and he sent Bob Cratchit home with regrets and, and he goes to his favorite place to eat and he's stingy and he's miserable and he runs the carolers off and he runs the beggars off and he crawls up into his cold, dark, cramped house all by himself. He sees Marley's face on the door knocker, which startles him and sets us off on this path into the supernatural. So he double locks the doors, he gets up in his room, he double checks everything, he closes the curtains, he gets by his fire, measly little fire with a little bowl of gruel, and Marley's ghost shows up. And Marley's ghost shows up to warn him that if he doesn't change, his life will end the same way that Marley's has. He's bound, now, just as a caveat, I'll just throw this out there. This is where we divert from scripture. Some of these ideas about ghosts and roaming ghosts and chains and all that stuff is not scriptural whatsoever. It's, it's, a, it's a literary license to, to tell a story and get, get the idea. But it's the same thing we used last year when we talked about angels and Clarence becoming an angel and getting his wings. And none of that's biblical either. But it makes a fantastical story and gives us a, a tool to imagine and, and then God could use our imagination to, to change our hearts, whether it's a ghost story or angels or puppy dogs. So Jacob's ghost shows up in chains, moaning about his destiny to wander the earth 
never able to do any good. A soul, a lost, departed soul, as, as Marley is now, in, bound in chains, never finding rest or peace, but only aware of the human need in the world and without the ability to do anything about it. That's, that's Dickens's view of hell. We realize convicted upon our death, those who, are, who die without Christ, who die without, as he would say, the spirit of Christmas in you, who die without Christ, who die selfish and alone, who live their life. And we have a story in the scripture that's something like this with the, with the um, beggar at the gate. And the rich man says, let me go back and tell my brothers. Let me go back and warn my brothers that they won't end up in the same fate that I have with the rich man and Lazarus. So we have this similar biblical theme. This he, he borrows and puts Marley here to uh, warn Ebenezer. And he's telling him that this chain that he drags, every link he woe, he built himself in his life. So every mean thing, every selfish thing, every every denial of good, every self-centered act of meanness and worldliness and ungodliness was another link in this chain. And now he drags it through eternity. And he warns Ebenezer that his chain is just, was just as long as his was when he died seven Christmas Eves ago. But now how much bigger and longer is your chain if you're aware of it, Ebenezer? And he says, Jacob, give me some good news. Can't you tell me something good? Give me some comfort. You've always been a good friend to me. And he says, I have none to give. It comes from other regions, other ministers, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Here's where he alludes to the, the ministering spirits, the angels of God, rather than the demonic. And he's without the ability to minister anything good to humankind. That only comes from the other ministers from the other re region or realm. In other words, from heaven, not hell. And he said, nor can I tell you that I'm just quoting from the book now, but nor can I tell you what I would. I can't tell you what I'd like to tell you. A very little more is permitted to me and I cannot rest and I cannot stay and I cannot linger. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. And then he goes to tell Ebenezer of, of all of the mistakes and, and all of the regrets he has of his life. And he says, oh, captive, bound and double ironed. So he's shackled as a slave to death and sin. Do not know that the ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. In other words, he, in life, he didn't realize the Christian life. And in the Christian life, life runs out before you are able to do all the good that you're capable of doing. As a Christian, our regrets are, I wish I could live longer to do more good. As a, as a lost sinner, as a non-believer, as someone whose destiny is with Marley's, his regret was the entire life was lived without doing any good, and now he can't do it. And all he's aware of is the regret that there's so much need and I have no ability to do it. And then Scrooge says, Ebenezer Scrooge says to Marley, okay, he says, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob. You were always a good man of business. And then the ghost cries out, business. And he wrings his hand, quoting from the book, mankind was my business, 
The common welfare was my business. Charity and mercy and forbearance is my business. And benevolence were my business. All my business. The dealing of my trade was but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. This is my life, what my business is all about, as Scrooge had said, warning the others in his office, that's not my business. My business consumes me. This is my business. And Jacob changes his and he says, you have it completely wrong. Your business, my business while alive, my business was the good of others, the benevolence of mankind. It was mercy and forbearance, forgiveness, charity. That was my business of which I did none. And he holds up his chain and he screams and he yells and he wanders out the window. And then the ghost of Christmas past shows up and leads Ebenezer through the images, starting as a little boy of Christmases. And Ebenezer, of course, remember the story. Ebenezer says, are you the ghost of Christmas past? And he says, I am. And he says, is it long ago? Christmas is a long since past. And he says, no, your past. So he deals specifically only with the Christmases of Ebenezer's past. And, and it's favorable. There are, some, there are some happy times and some sad times. And we get this picture of what shaped Ebenezer into the man he is there. What were the experiences of his life? The heartaches and the hurts and the joys and the disappointments and the brokenness and the deaths and the, and the disappointments and the betrayals that led him to be the man that he finds himself to be tonight. I think it's time that you and I stopped and thought about that too. It's easy to look back on, on our Christmases and that's what we're gonna do this week in our devotionals and in, um, in our study, we're going to take looks at our Christmases in the past, our lives in the past. What happened to me in my 60 years to make me the man I am tonight? You know, there's that, what is that country road song? Uh, God bless the broken road that led me to you. You know, there's a lot of things that you say that, well, I wouldn't change it for the world because that's made me who the man I am today. But there are some things that I would change in a heartbeat. There are some decisions that I regret to this day. There are some choices that I made that I would not have made again. And I would never make again if I had another chance. But there were some wonderful opportunities that I was given as well. And there are people that came into my life that I had no idea were going to be there that did wonderful things for me and gave me chances and opportunities. And I remember those because they contributed to who I am. And the favor of God with me, getting me through hard times when I made bad choices and, and leading me to paths of righteousness for his namesake, leading me by still waters and green pastures, pursuing me with goodness and mercy. I look back on that and I see how the hand of God has formed me and changed me and molded me and made me who I am. But I also realize that my life is, is unique to me. And it would be very easy to just take for granted who I am and what I have and just deal with my own business for my own business is more than enough to consume my time. But as we glance back, I see how others' Christmases past weren't anything as glorious as mine. Many of the people that I know and many of you have hurting pasts, stories like Ebenezer being left behind, being forgotten, being taken advantage of and betrayed. You weren't ever in a place where you had the fortune that these movies celebrate. It's easy for you and I to get caught up and think that 
that's the way we live, so that's the way everybody lived, and that's just not the case. So at the very least, as we get through this ghost of Christmas past, maybe we can become aware of how much we have, that our time is short, and that, yes, we have issues and struggles and challenges, but God can move us to recognize those broken areas and hurting places in others. And maybe we could be the person who steps in at the perfect time to forgive and to restore and, and to offer something more, even though they've never had it. I know that some of the regrets I have is assuming everybody has the same past as I do. And I know many have not had the favor and the fortune that I have in my life. And I don't wanna wait till God has to send me Jacob Marley's ghost to open my eyes and get my attention to make a better ending than I had begun. Psalm 51, let's read a few of these verses together. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here and now I acknowledge my sin before you. My sin is always before me, and it's always only against you. And I've done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I know I was brought forth in iniquity, and my sin, in sin my mother conceived me. But you desire the truth on the inside of me, and you hidden in me a part which makes me long for your wisdom. So purge me with hyssop and I'll sh I shall be clean. Wash me and make me whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways. And I will teach sinners. And they shall be converted to you. This is a portion of the word of God for the people of God. He says, you do not delight in burnt sacrifices. But what pleases you is a broken and contrite heart. As we look into the pages of Ebenezer Scrooge and we start to see a glimpse of his heart, this heart starting to crack. May God reveal in us a broken and contrite heart as well, that we might lead others to him. Amen and amen. Enjoy the rest of the day. Come back for the concert tonight. Get your picture taken. Post it on Facebook so I can see it and see how you guys are all dressed up. And God bless you, and I'll see you real soon.